All right, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, our friend Zach here. How many of you guys know Zach? All right, good number of you. For those of you who do not know Zach, I was uh, getting to know him a little bit better this morning. And he is currently 18 years old, a senior at uh, Whitehall High School, and he has a passion for music. I know when I first started coming to this church, I noticed that there was a very good organist, and I appreciate that. Uh, I've really been blessed by his organ playing and his other music. He sings, he plays piano, and I've really been blessed, and I hope you guys have been as well. Um, when I asked Zach what he was passionate about, he said, playing organ, pathfinders. But then he said something that I really thought was good. He said that um, he loves reading God's word and telling others about Jesus. And that warms my heart. I'm sure it warms yours as well. So now please give him your undivided attention. I'm sure he has a wonderful message from the Lord to share with you this morning. The floor is yours. Happy Sabbath, church. Let me get this open up real quick. So... Um, does anybody know what, what that's a map of? China, yeah. In China, 541 to 479 BC, we have one of the greatest teachers in Earth's history. What's his name? Confucius. Yes, Confucius was known for um, founding Confucianism, and he had, it was the belief in ancestral reverence and human-centered religiousness. And Confucianism was a major philosophical viewpoint of China for 2,000 years, and it still is a major part of their political society and of their lifestyle even today. And then we go to ancient Greece, 384 to 322 BC, and we have Aristotle. Aristotle. Aristotle was um, Aristotle was a Greek philosopher in Athens, and he was known for his work as a teacher in the Lyceum and his many theories on ethics, on politics, and science. And um, he was also the teacher of Alexander the Great, who would later become the the emperor of ancient Greece. Then we go to ancient Jerusalem, AD 31. We have the greatest teacher of all. What's his name? Jesus Christ. And then uh, AD 31, when Jesus was ascending into heaven, he told his disciples this statement. Go ye therefore to all the world, teaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father and, the, and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. And lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. All right. My, t my title for today's sermon is Teach One. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this day you bless us with. Thank you for your word that you've given us. And as I open the word, I ask that you preach, you speak through me and not me speaking on my own. And that you... You guide this sermon and touch the hearts of everyone listening today. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus tells us to teach the world, to baptize, and to make disciples. And, but first, if we are to be teachers, we ought to first be taught of God. But how does God teach us? First, let's open to John chapter 16, verse 7 to 13. John chapter 16, verse 7 to 13. Whose chapter is this? Dennis? You should know this by heart. <laughs> We're doing PBE, and our book this year is John, so uh, it's, no, it's no wonder that a lot of my uh, verses come from that book. Um, John chapter 16, verse 7 to 13. So G at this time... Jesus, was, Jesus knew his time was coming, that he should depart from the world, and that he was going to God because he was going to be our sacrifice for our sins. And before he left, um, before this great trial that was ahead of him, 
he had to prepare his disciples for the time when he would when they wouldn't have him anymore. So he tells them this in John chapter 16, verse 7 to 13. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but what ha- whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So who is Jesus talking about here? The Holy Spirit. That is the helper who, he, who he's going to send. So the first way that God speaks to to us is through his Holy Spirit. Wait. It's through his Holy Spirit. And um, the Holy Spirit would convict us, convict us of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, which is the path of redemption. So of sin is basically justification. We can't come to God and be repentant unless the Holy Spirit um, leads us to repentance. And sanct- of, of righteousness, that's the path of sanctification. Throughout our lives, um, if we have the Holy Spirit with us, we become more and more like Jesus Christ. And finally, redemption of judgment. That is when uh, the world will be judged and we will finally enter heaven and be glorified. So the spirit of truth will guide you into all tr- the spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. Why do we need guidance into truth? Can't we just see the truth for ourselves? Can we? No, we can't. In, in the book of Proverbs, a very wise man tells us, there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Without the Spirit to guide us, we are completely lost. Isaiah 30 verse 21 says, Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. Um, throughout Jesus' life, he was guided by, G- by um, the Holy Spirit. And he had the Holy Spirit throughout his every step. And throughout his journey to the cross, he had the Holy Spirit guiding him. And that was how he was able to teach the world. And that's what... Uh, being a Christian is. It's a journey. And learning is a journey. So let's open to 1 Peter 2, verse 1 to 3. 1 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3. That's after Hebrews, Hebrews, James, yeah, after James, 1 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3. Um, can I have uh, one of our young people read that for us? Joel? Oh, Hunter, can you read? Oh, let's get a mic. Can we use it? Now this was the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babies desire the the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If needed, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Amen. So Peter is telling us that we start off as babes desiring the sincere milk of the word of God. That's why I had a, a, young, a young person speak for us. Thank you, Hunter. Um, so we start off as babes. That means we start off not knowing much. Like a baby, we are crawling, we are eating, we are only drinking the milk. And that milk is the sincere milk of the word of God. 
And, and uh, although we start off as ba babies in the Christian walk, we do not stay babies. We continually grow. Uh, Proverbs 4.18 says, But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. So continually through our walk in Christ, we um, gain more knowledge and we uh, get better at um, understanding his will until the perfect day, the day of glorification. Um, so... So we now know that um, that uh, we are led by the Holy Spirit. Um, that we um, that uh, learning is a journey, and now we just need to understand what we need to be teaching as teachers of God's will. Um, so that can be answered in one word, actually, and that word is here. It's the Bible. So let's open to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 to 5. 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 to 5. So Paul wrote this book to his apprentice, Timothy, right? And who was Timothy? How does the Bible describe Timothy? He was a young, he was a young uh, pastor, wasn't he? And, um, and uh, from a young age, he had learned what it means to be a Christian, what it means to have the word of God with him. So in 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 to 5, um, can we have someone read that for us, loud and clear? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desire, because they have hitching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will run, they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to verbals. Five, but you be watchful. In all things, endure affliction. Do not walk of an, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Amen. So, Paul is urging Timothy to preach the word. In my Bible, preach the word is an exclamation. So, it must have some emphasis behind that. Preach the word. I feel like that's how he meant to say it. Anyway, so Paul is urging Timothy to teach the word because he knows truth is the only defense against sin and Satan's temptations. So Timothy, as, a, as Paul's apprentice, he learned the importance of having God with you, having the Holy Spirit, and also having uh, the word of God to teach others. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 10 to 11, let's read that real quick. It says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, Purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, per perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. And then we skip to verses 15 to 17. And, from, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul was a great teacher, and he, if he was telling Timothy to preach the word, shouldn't we also heed this admonition? But if we go to verse 3 of chapter 4, it, it says in the last part, they will heap up for themselves teachers. The people we may be wanting to teach may not want to listen to our teachings. We go, that reminds me of the parable in Matthew 13, 18 to 23, about the sower. Everybody knows that parable, right? So if you don't, let's open to it, and uh, I'll give a brief synopsis of the parable. But it's basically talking about how 
the, the sower goes out to sow and he, he sows seed by the wayside. He sows some on um, the, the thorns and also some on good crop, on, on fertile soil, I mean. And what do we know about these different uh, soils? What do we know about these dif different soils? Do the, um, does the wayside produce any, any crop? Well, it does. Wait, no, it doesn't. The rock, it doesn't. The, the rock produces a crop. But when, the, when it's thrown on stony places, uh, it produces crop. But when that happens, the sun dries it up because there's no root. And the one that's thrown on the thorny side, on the, on the thorns, gets choked up. So let's read verses 18 to 23 real quick. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, when the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in, this, sown in his heart, this is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed of, on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arise, arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So the sower is, is the teacher in this case. And the sower is preaching God's word, but there's different types of people out there. There's different types of soils. And the soil is your heart. And um, it's up to the, the person who's listening to have his heart uh, ready to hear God's word. And that's why the Holy Spirit is vital in, um, in the ministry. That's why the Holy Spirit is vital when we're teaching God's word, because the Holy Spirit is the one that uh, produces this change in the person's heart so that um, he sees the, uh, the need for him to listen to God's word. So this is why um, there's those in, as uh, Paul mentioned in First Timothy chapter, I mean, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, there's those people that, uh, that aren't ready to hear God's word and instead are heaping up for themselves teachers and would rather believe lies than the truth. But then God tells us, Jesus tells us in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, go therefore teaching them to observe all things. He doesn't say some things. He doesn't say a few things. He doesn't say most things. He says all things. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. So Jesus teaches us all things. Te Jesus tells us to teach all things. He wants us to say the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We are not, I mean, we are called to preach. Um, in uh, the book of education, Ellen G. White says this, says the following. Uh, who wants to read that for me? Malix, can you do that? Can you, can you see? All right. The greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle in the to the pole, men who will stand for the right through the heavens fall. So, the world is in need of these type of men, men who will call sin by its right name, men who have the conscience that is true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. These are the type of people that Jesus, that God needs in the last day to, to uh, teach the word, to preach the word. 
as um, it should be preached. And now we go to Jesus Christ. Jesus is a good shepherd and he protects his sheep. But sometimes, what happens? Sometimes wolves enter the fold. In Matthew chapter 17, I mean Matthew chapter 7 verse 15 it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. How does the wolf enter the fold? How is that possible? Does it look like a wolf? No, it, it looks like a sheep. Um, so that's how it works. They enter the fold through deception. So who are the, the wolves in sheep clothing? Beware of the false prophets. Those are the wolves in sheep clothing. The false teachers of today's time are amassing such a large crowd, such a large following because they mix truth with a little lie. What is that called? A white lie, right? But Isaiah 8 verse 20 tells us how to know who is the false teacher. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This is why we need to teach all things, teach all the truth and nothing but the truth, and call sin by its rightful name, so that the children of God are not deceived by the wiles of the devil and the white lies of false prophets. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. This is what, this is the state of the world today, is it not? People are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The false teachers in today's time are amassing such a large following and the lost people that hang on to every word that they speak are, may seem unreceptive to, to the truth. But how do we reach these people who have been deceived by the devil and are ultimately headed for destruction? God has told us, Jesus has told us, teach all things. But there's this problem ahead of us. There's false doctrines all over the world. And what are these false doctrines? We go to, this is the first one. They say the law has been done away with because of Christ's sacrifice. We know that's wrong. They also say that Sunday is the true day of worship. We know that's false. Sabbath is a day of worship. They also say that God did not create the world in six literal days, and it must have been millions of years for us to come into existence, but we know that that is wrong. They also say that when the soul dies, it goes to heaven or it goes to hell. They believe in the immortality of the soul and that no one truly dies. We know that is wrong. They also destroy the sanctity of marriage and we know that God ordained marriage in the Garden of Eden and we are to protect it just as much as we are to protect the Sabbath and all the other stuff that God has commanded. So how do we reach these people? Is there a way to reach the people who are being deceived? There must be. God tells us, call sin by its right name. Teach all things. Beware of false prophets. There are false doctrines out there, right? And we are, to, we are to do all these things, call sin by its right name, teach all things, beware of false prophets. But how do we do that in a way that, that will reach them and not push them away? Um, so I would like to use this illustration. Uh, who are the Seventh-day Adventists or the Remnant Church compared to? Huh? I'm close. Uh, but I'm thinking more ancient times, really far back. The children of Israel. So we go to the story of Israel, right? And if we use them as an example or as a, 
as an example, right? Because Paul tells us that these things were written as an example that we should know what to do, right? They were, they were known as Abraham's seed, right? They were, they were called from bondage and given the pro- promised land, but they constantly backslid and committed idolatry. So God gave them to captivity. We have the captivity with the Assyrians, the Assyrians. We have the captivity of the Babylonians. So it continued up until that time. And after their captivity in Babylon, when they returned to Jerusalem, they, they realized that they should not be uh, committing idolatry anymore. And that was good. But at the same time, they made the mistake of creating a wall of partition between them and the people outside, between them and the Gentiles. So they kept the law of God, but they didn't have the love of God. But then we contrast that with the story of Jesus. What does it say in um, John 1, verse 14, to 7, 14 and 17? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then verse 17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the word made flesh because he acted out God's commandments with grace. The children of Israel had the letter of the, letter of the law, but they did not have the spirit of the law. This is what Jesus came to show us as well as the whole world. Jesus taught the truth in love. Then we go to John 8, verse 10 to 12. In John chapter 8, we have two striking, strikingly different examples of how Jesus taught the truth. Um, so this is the story of the woman caught in adultery. Uh, we know the story. Um, the woman was caught in adultery, and then a bunch of men brought her, brought her to Jesus, and they said, what shall we do? The, Moses commands us to stone them. And... Uh, but then he's thinking like, it, but then at the same time, they're not allowed to commit murder because that was against the law of the time. Um, so Jesus is caught in between a rock and a hard place, but Jesus is known as the wisest man, right? Because he had the Holy Spirit with him. And what does he, what does he say after this whole situation is over? He says, um, who... Who has, who has not sinned may throw the first stone, right? And then they leave because all of them knew they had sinned. And he's writing in the sand their sin, so it's right there. So in verses 10 to 12, after this happens, he says, When Jesus had raised himself and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So if if anybody else was caught in this situation, they probably would have fumbled the bag, as we say in contemporary times. But um, (laughs) but, uh, Jesus did not. He had the Holy Spirit leading him. And he... He uh, rebuked her in a way that was gentle, right? He didn't say that you did wrong, you get punishment. He said, where are your accusers? Go out and sin no more. So Jesus did not use any harsh word to reprove her of her sin, but he does it in a gentle manner. But then we go later in the chapter, in verse 44, he's speaking to the, the Jews. You are of your father, the devil. Wow, that's crazy. Imagine calling someone else the devil's son. And the desire of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. He is a liar and the father of it. Wow. This is so different, right? In one instance, he's telling the the person, Go out and sin no more. And this one, he's telling them, you are of your father, the devil. So it's still Jesus. He's still speaking the truth in love. So why does he 
why is there such a contrast between the way he does this? Can, uh, can someone give a guess or can someone answer for me? I'm confused. Yes. Yeah, God, Jesus always looks in the heart. He doesn't look at the appearance, right? And from the heart, you could tell that this woman was probably caught in a bad place. She, she had a good heart, but she was in a bad situation. But then he's looking at the Jews, and he sees their heart outrightly. It's the heart of the devil. And these Jews, they were calling themselves the seed of Abraham, but they weren't doing the deeds that Abraham would do. He says that if you were the seed of Abraham, you would believe me because Abraham believed in me. Jesus came to uproot the deep-seated false doctrines about him, right? He needed to speak more directly with the Jews because they were the leaders and they had, they had led the people astray. So when we see the teaching, when, so when we see, so what we see is that teaching requires us to tailor our message depending on who we're speaking to, right? But that doesn't mean that we need to water it down. But to tailor it, if we are to follow Christ's example, right, we should, we should learn to teach the truth in love. If we are to learn from the mistake of the children of Israel, we are not to keep the truth to ourselves. Finally, we come to John 1, four, verse 14, Actually, we're backtracking here. It says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the theme of the Bible. Jesus is the message that the people need to hear. What was that song? Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Jesus used his words to teach, but at the same time, well, his most effective method was his actions. His deeds were the, one, were the things that were producing fruit. That's what we look on. We look at his words, but we also look at his deeds. He is the word made flesh, as this says, and everything he did was to glorify the Father. He says that he does not speak his own words, but just as the Father has commanded me, so I speak. John chapter 10, verse 25 says, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. His words, his works were the greatest, um, were the greatest uh, display of his, his, um, his position as the Son of God. When the Jews did not believe his works, then they were left in their own condemnation. And we are to follow Christ's example. We are to perform the works that he has told us to, to do. He says that the, the, master, the servant is not greater than, than the master, neither is he who sent greater than he who sent him. So if we are to follow Christ's example, we are to do as he did. We are to preach the word and to do the word. And we are to do this in love. Amen. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you blessed us with. Thank you for what we've been able to learn today, and thank you for giving me the message to preach. And as we live our lives, we ask that you fill our hearts, fill us with your spirit, and lead us every step of the journey, it's teaching us what to do, to, whether to go to the right or to the left, and give us your word to preach to others and Give us the power to, and to uh, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling so that we can be a light to the world that others may, may come to you and others may be, be converted. And please guide us now forevermore. Lead us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um,